Welcome, everybody. We are back. This is Connected Educator Month. Uh, I am Carl Hooker, your host tonight, and we will be talking about, this is part of our EdTech Teacher webinar series uh, as Connected Educators, and tonight's topic, we're going to talk about some ideas related to the one-to-one -one classroom, uh, but let's go over a few details before we dive in. Uh, we're joined by a great, very diverse group of educators here in the Hangout, and I want to share the, uh, who they are briefly, so let's let them introduce themselves. We'll start with Sean. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sean McCusker. I'm an ed tech teacher, uh, instructor, and presenter. I'm also a high school social studies teacher at Fremd High School in Palatine, Illinois. Uh, on Twitter, I um, am the creator and co-leader of One to One Tech Chat. We discuss the issues and best practices related to One to One uh, technology in the classroom. And I'm also a co-moderator of the Ing SS Chat combined uh, Common Core Curriculum Chat that meets once a week. Well, excuse me, once a month between SS Chat and English Chat. That's very connected of you, Sean. It's very, very connected. Appropriate. Thank you. <laughs> and all the way from the great state of California, joining us tonight, we have Don. Great. Uh, my name is Don Orth. I'm a director of technology and strategic partnerships at Hillbrook School, uh, Northern California, a 315 student independent school. Um, and I'm also part of the SIG uh, independent school group, um, subgroup of uh, ISTE and an ed tech teacher, uh, leader, and presenter. So glad to be here. Excellent. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Carl Hooker. You can follow me at Twitter, at Mr. Hooker, um, which you can see right there in the webinar window. I'm the Director of Instructional Technology at EANS ISD here in Austin, Texas, uh, which is why we still have daylight behind us, for those of you on the East Coast that may be dark. Uh, I'm an Apple Distinguished Educator, an ed tech teacher consultant, and here at EANS, we are actually a one-to-one K-12 -to uh, iPad school district with about a little over 8,000 students now. Um, I'm also the founder of an event called iPad Palooza that we run here in June, which we, it's always a fun learning festival with live music and food trailers and all that. Um, but the big thing about that event and like this month is talking about the focus on uh, connecting educators and what that looks like in a one-to-one -one classroom. So before we kind of dive into the first question, just a couple of little bits of housekeeping here. Uh, if you can't see us, you're going to have to hit the refresh button. But of course, if you can't see us, you wouldn't have heard that. That's a hmm. joke. Um, so yeah, for those of you that are interested, there is the chat wing down there at the bottom. And I noticed that we have at least we have 23 people, it looks like, in there. So if you want to, you can introduce yourself in the chat wing. If you have questions for the panel, uh, you can go ahead and enter those questions in there. And we'll try to get to as many of those as possible in our hour here together tonight. Um, and so let's start with the, kind of the first core concept, and that is, what exactly, like, why would you even want to be connected, first of all, and uh, how is it that one-to-one -one helps with that? I think this seems like a fairly obvious question, but maybe not not so much. So um, which one of you wants to take that one first? I'll jump on that one first. Right. Um, I think that the connected classroom is um, exactly that. It's connected to reality. And sometimes in a classroom where we have these very safe four walls and we have our students in very neatly organized, tidy um, environments, we we really need to connect with the legitimacy of our information or connect with that information in context so that it means something to them. And I think that um, the connected classroom fights against the artificiality of some of the, um, the, the lessons that we have when they're pulled completely out of how they exist in the world. So by connecting outside of, of your classroom, you can see your ideas and concepts in, in play. You can discuss, discuss them with other people who maybe didn't have the same instruction that your students did and you start to unfold layers of complexity of the ideas that we're talking about. So I think that the ideas come alive, and they, they give up a certain simplicity, um, which I think is a really important thing for us to do, to, to kind of demonstrate the, the beautiful, connected complexity of the ideas that we're teaching in our classes. That's very well said. Don, what do, you, do you have a yeah, follow-up to that? Why, would, that? why would you want to be connected? I, you know, I think that sums it up. I don't, I don't know what else to say. No, I, I could add a few, a few <laughs> thoughts. Um, you know, I, I, I always think about uh, kind of relevance and dignity, and I'm sure Sean uh, said some of that in, in, in um, his description, but um, really making student work valuable um, and important. I think often uh, the work they do feels really isolated and just for the sake of it, for the sake of their teacher. Right. Um, so if, if the work is you know, for a broader audience. I mean, one thing I think about is uh, the platforms uh, that students have outside in the real world. They have social media platforms. They have um, ways they connect with their friends in the classroom. The only platform they have is really um, that in their classroom, and the teacher is their only audience. 
um, and maybe their classmates, but when you elevate um, the work they're doing to a broader audience, to a, a um, kind of a higher platform where um, what they have to do makes an impact on other people or affects other people. Okay. I think that's really important. So I would say that that's, that's the one thing I really think about a lot, um, why connected, being connected is important. Yeah, and I, you, you hit on something there that I, we got, this morning we had the pleasure of seeing George Kuros. I don't know how many, I think I'm pronouncing his last name right, um, from Canada. And he's uh, amazing. I got a chance to see him speak this morning. And actually one of the things he talked about was just what you were saying there, Don, about the connectedness and about the meaningfulness of the work. There was an eight, he has a story about an eight-year-old girl who wrote, um, whose third grade teacher said, okay, I want everyone to write their own blog. We're going to catalog kind of the year through our own blog and keep it, you know, fairly out there. She, you know, she posts this, whatever was important, they put it out for the web to see. Um, but they were doing a study on the book, uh, it's The Dot, by Peter Reynolds. And what happened was, is uh, she had written a little, uh, she did a little blog about it, first a video blog about what she thought about the book, and then she did an illustration and posted it on her blog, and then sent it out there. Well, this, this got to George, who then tweeted it out, who then found somebody else who connected with the actual author, Peter Reynolds. So in one of her 15 comments on her blog post was the actual author of the book who said, wow, that's a great drawing you did there. I'm really impressed with the way you did this, and thank you so much for sharing. And he actually mentioned her by name. And so how powerful is that as a student, an eight-year-old, to all of a sudden have the author of a book say your name? It wasn't just like an auto-response. I mean, he was actually reading and looking at her work. Uh, I thought that was great, and that adds, that kind of addresses the meaning points you're talking about. Did you have something else you were going to say there, uh, Sean? Yeah, you know, I, when, when Don was talking, I started thinking about, like, think about within your classroom, as soon as you break down the individuality of work and you start doing group work, compare the energy in your room from group work uh, on, a, on an individual basis to when you do, excuse me, like one-to-one -one work to like individual, what, I just said that, to a group of students who are working together and sharing their work. And then think about what happens once those groups come together and the whole class is sharing what they've done in terms of the energy. And I think that it's a maybe an exponential step beyond that, like, Don said, once you get those blogs out there, once you bring the world together, the students will start looking forward to the, those things so much that you feel compelled as a teacher to create those situations as much as you can. You know, I last year I did a, a Skype chat with Kenneth C. Davis, who's written well over 20 best-selling books in history, geography, and government. And this year I couldn't make his, he was doing geography and it didn't really fit with my curriculum, but I was able to bring that to another teacher. And... Um, you could see on her face when she came back from that experience, the first time she'd ever Skyped with an author, what had just happened, like the power that she had brought into her class. And all of her students were talking to this man outside and talking about why he was writing these books and the passion he brought to geography. And it wasn't like, oh, my teacher makes me study geography. Now it was, wow, this can be really exciting. And it was really meaningful to that man who's dedicated his life to it. And that energy and validity goes towards what Don said about relevance. It made it so relevant for them. So, I mean, I, I think Don and I could both speak to this, is that we would love to have an entire school made up of Sean. <laughs> and, 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 and someone just mentioned in the chat, you know, you know, some teachers are a little more reluctant to do that. And so I guess I'll pose this question to you, Sean, and then I'll ask Don as well, like what his angle is on this. How do you get other teachers on board? I know that's not your job necessarily, Sean, but you, you're modeling this. So are you sharing that with other teachers in your school, or how does that, how does that look at your school? You know, it's a great question, and I'm going to try to be realistic about this, and and then I'll talk to you about what I've learned. Okay. I can't preach and proselytize about the connected classroom because when you look at the ultimate understanding of teachers comes with the knowledge of their relationship with time, which is entirely dysfunctional. We, <laughs> we think about seconds like crazy, and we, we split we split our minutes in half to get the most out of our classes. So when I talk about things like that, it's hard to demonstrate to teachers in the office that the time that would be spent setting that up, getting the technology in place, preparing the students, it's a week of preparation to do it well, is worth it until you've done it once. And then you can't imagine not doing it again. Yeah. So for me, the best that I can do is support people. I can invite them to my class every chance I get. I can... Um, I really, I think the best way to convince other teachers to do it is to have the buzz when the students walk out of your classroom and they're talking about that energy because teachers are drawn to the energy. Mm -hmm. And if you can capture that in your class, it's like lightning in a bottle. Hmm. But um, it, it's hard when you're isolated in doing it. And I can't say that I haven't been some frustrated sometimes. 
but I see that there's this slow movement, and it's not glacial, but um, teachers are starting to realize and hear and pay attention to what is possible, and I think that as a culture, we're moving in that direction. So um, when it comes down to it, I'll say this. Do excellent work, and let that work speak for itself. And then when people ask questions, answer them honestly, and if your work is truly excellent, um, they will come around. That's a good point. I, and I think I'll, I'll have Don kind of address this too, but as you were talking, Sean, I was thinking there's always, we have those kind of out there teachers that, that I think are very similar to you in the sense that they're going to be gangbusters about things. And it, almost in a way, they hurt some of the movement, just to be honest, because I think other teachers see them as well. They're the go-getters. They're the outliers. Um, they do that. They know that tech stuff, so why should I bother? So for me, it's always powerful to find someone who's not that way and then get them to put in that time you're talking about, Sean. Like, it takes a week to really prepare something like that, but maybe I help them or one of my ed techs helps them kind of get that set up the first time and then watch it take off. But I think you're right on point there. It takes the time to get it set up, but once they feel the buzz the first time, they're going to want to do it because ultimately they're here for the kids, uh, let's hope. And so they'll want to continue to do those kind of things. Don, what, do you, what is your, you know, kind of, saying on this in terms of getting teachers Yeah, I mean, I, 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 that, right, I mean, certainly from, from the kind of the tech director point of view, um, it's so important to make these things, um, to support teachers when they do this or are curious about it. You know, all I want is a teacher to ask, you know, I'd really, I'd be really interested in trying this, or, you know, in the case of bringing somebody in, um, we have this person, we can't get them in, we'd love to bring them in, can you help me set it up? And just be there all the way from start to finish, and, and making it seem you know, as easy as possible, making sure the systems work, being there for every kind of, um, kind of every step of the way so that the, the tech doesn't get in the way of, of the value. Um, because this isn't about technology, really, right? It's about connecting um, the outside world to the classroom. So you don't, this is a situation where you want tech to be complete, as transparent as possible. So I think that that's my role um, as a tech director. It's, it's my role with my coaches. Um, you know, as coaches, they need to be there too, just supporting the the kind of the, that gap between um, tech and the the tasks that that teachers want to have happen. And, and in a way, I mean, when you get to that point where you're actually going to do it, um, somebody asked on the chat, like, what technology do I use? Mm -hmm. Do I use Skype or do I use Google? And so, Chris, who posed that question, um, mm -hmm. you know, that those things are really hard because you make a mistake and you have to know what you're going to do. You might have to cancel a chat. So the first time I did it with Skype, Skype was failing every 10 minutes, and we just had a protocol. When Skype fails, I want you to immediately take out your paper and journal a couple of thoughts and comment on something. So they had a, pre, a predetermined downtime activity that they were supposed to immediately That's use the transition to, and it worked really well. Yeah. Um, you can make those breaks. Once you realize that those things are going to happen, you start to do the teacher thinking on that, like let's not lose this time, reflect here. But I think at some level, when people are stressed, um, I, I don't want to say this in a derogatory or, or like flippant way. They just need somebody to hold their hand through the parts that they don't understand. So at school, I asked if they would um, change my supervision for next semester to being a tech coach during first hour of the day. And my goal is not to be at a place where people can come and talk to me. I really want people to come and tell me what they want to do in their class and then I can come in and like either model it for them or evaluate them as they try it. And I think that that kind of support is what's going to make that transition easier for people. Well, one of the one of the I think really important roles as a tech uh, of a tech coach or someone who's um, working with other teachers is um, modeling modeling the trouble. You know what you do when things don't go right. Yeah. You know it's because you know you've seen. Um, you know, it's something I work on my, with my coaches a lot on, like, you know, when you're up there and working with a teacher yeah. and, and co-teaching, um, you know, when something fails, don't go, ah, you know, you, you got <laughs> to be like, ah, of course, you know, that, that could happen, and then kind of go through the trouble, and even kind of a, as a coach, talking out loud, you know, what are the troubleshooting steps? Oh, well, this might take a few minutes. Let me make sure I have my, stu you know, my students have something to do while I work this out, or, well, let's, you know, put this on, side, on the side and, and let's, you know, tend to the students and then come back to it. But really um, walking through the process of troubleshooting um, when tech goes wrong, because inevitably it's going to go wrong. Um, I, call it, I call it the first rule of technology. What, technology will fail you. And <laughs> it, it's going to. I mean, it's a complex thing, and it can possess so much power. But because of that, when it fails us, it could have a powerful effect on what we're doing. So the, the trick to, to beating the first rule of technology is knowing what you'll do when it goes wrong. 
-hmm. and keeping composed. Because by the way, if the teachers lose their mind when the yeah. technology goes bad, the students will lose their minds too. And you're yeah. setting yourself up for a whole host of behavior problems. Well, I would I would say just uh, and I'll, I know Carl sounds like you got something, but just um, a note on that. You know, we ha um, had a situation where a teacher has had difficulty dealing with tech trouble um, and really modeled that. You know, that real difficulty and frustration, and that whole class is impacted. And so, like, I, I'm I'm not only working with the teacher, but it's the students also. Their attitude towards troubleshooting tech, whereas another grade or another class. Completely different attitude, same technology, but um, the teacher modeling what to do when tech goes wrong is, has a huge impact across the board um, on, on, on colleagues and, and students. And it's almost funny to me that in some ways, my teachers, they love it when it fails on me. Hmm. Uh, because yeah. they, cause they're almost like, you're the I mechanic. You. Yeah, when you come into the room, it, like everything magically works somehow. <laughs> um, you guys have that same touch, I'm sure, and it's it's all, it's all the aura. It's aura. <laughs> the hooker touch. Take that as you will, but right. <laughs> yes, I had to throw that in. Lines have been crossed. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> but but the other thing that was amazing to me is that we just you know before we launched this initiative, we had uh, you know our superintendent was one of the first ones, and she's going to be really upset that I tell this story, but she's she's very comfortable with it. She was one of the first ones to get an iPad, and so at our first convocation in front of a thousand people, she got up on stage with the iPad and was going to use it to take her notes. And all of our staff, the entire staff of the entire district is there watching her, and it failed. It locked up on her, and she was trying to scroll through a pages document. It moved all of her words around, and she was stumbling over her words. And so on her microphone, she says under her breath, she's like, and would Carl Hooker please come up to the stage? <laughs> and the whole time I'm, I'm thinking, oh, no, this is like my one moment to sit back and relax. But she recovered very gracefully, and, and we kind of got through it real quick and made a joke out of it. I, like, kind of stumbled, like kind of a Chris Farley move. And everyone thought that was a skit. They're like, wow, that was great. How you guys did that whole routine? Did you plan it? They're like, no, it's just the way you, when technology fails, you just have to be ready for it. And so I think even by her, if you have your leaders take risks and fail a little bit, right. I think that goes a long way towards your teachers feeling comfortable with that same failure. I think there's so much pressure with the testing nowadays, and we bring it up all the time, but you know, they feel like they have to get it right, or mm -hmm. any time yeah. lost is like time lost to, to completing the, the tasks for that test review. So... Um, so yeah. That's the yeah, dysfunction of teachers' relationship with time, too. We're just, everyone is so pressured for time. Do you, were you guys um, at the iPad Summit in Boston last year? Angela Myers was giving her a keynote speech. It was a wonderful keynote speech about helping your students to matter and connecting. But I remember that her presentation room stopped working. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if either of you remember that. She, and like, you didn't see her freak out. She stayed calm. And I was, I remember sitting there thinking, like, this is what happens at a tech conference. It's not that the technology doesn't fail you. It's just that people smoothly can move past that. Right. Because they're used to using technology, and this moment has happened before. You know, so in a real sense, using technology effectively in the classroom is about using it when it fails and making that smooth in your classroom. It's not, I mean, sometimes it's eliminating the failures, but other times it's just managing those failures as they come. When, and the truth is, students are amazingly resilient, right? I mean, they are, you know, kids are resilient anyway in the real, in, in other parts of the world. But with technology, they're amazingly resilient too. You know, I hear about kids, um, you know, working on something and losing their work. And it certainly happened when we were using, you know, old desktop PCs and things like that. Like, computer crashed, I forgot to save. And I mean, it happens with iPads and, and tablets too. You know, it happens. And kids, you know, I've just seen them. I, you know, some kids freak out for sure. But other kids were like, yep, yeah, I lost it, and here I go again. Um, so, you know, is there is there value in that? Certainly, I don't know, but um, but they need to know how to do it, you know, how to react and how to, yeah. how to operate. I think that will help those reluctant teachers, too, if you have those students in the classrooms and some teachers that are willing to give up a little bit of the control and say, okay, teacher, these two students are like my tech aides, and there's always kids, you know, willing to jump up and do that. And I think it models some things for the other students who say, wow, she's willing to go ahead and let me kind of have that control, a little bit of the control in the room. I mean, it's a good tool that, I mean, and Sean, you're a teacher, but, you know, Don and I have been teachers too. It's something that we've always done. You take the one or two kids that are really out there sometimes, or in my case, I would take the one kid that seemed like it was always trying to get in trouble, and you give them a little bit of power, but not a lot, and just enough to kind of make them yeah. excited and engage in the classroom. And yeah. a lot of them tend to be really tech-driven. Um, it's a good point. And, yeah. It, 
so I guess the, to kind of move along here, but just talking about tools, we talked briefly about a couple. I think you mentioned Skype. That was one that we started with way back when. Uh, but then our network guys immediately came down on us, and so it's like, well, you can't use Skype because it uses way too much bandwidth, and so we have to schedule it and go through a whole process. So I think for those that are watching online um, and are going to be watching this later, they're always wondering, like, what are some what are some ways to kind of get around that, not necessarily get around your tech department, but what are some kind of quick tools that you could use probably right out the box today um, that you uh, you guys use to kind of connect in your one-to-one -one classroom? So, Don, do you have any? I noticed you listed a few here in our back notes. Do you have some you want to share? Yeah, um, I mean, today today's meeting is, is a go-to. It's a it's um it's a place that we start kind of educating even even young students, um, second, third, fourth graders. Yeah. You know, how do you how do you connect to a broader world? How do you you know back to the platform when you're given a, a more public platform? How do you behave? How do you communicate? Um, so that one works really well. And and the nice thing is super low um, entry point, right? Anybody can set it up. It's just it, and it just works. Like I don't think it's ever not worked. Um, so that's that's nice to have a tool that just works out now of the box. Now it's not going to work. Thanks. No, <laughs> I do know of one time when it didn't work. Actually, just one time, and it was during the presidential election when everyone was using it. I was I was uh -huh. on um, today's meet with my students, chatting during the presidential debates, and their parents were contributing too. We had students and parents in this big group discussion, and it failed. But the next night, I got an email from today's meet telling me. We promise it will be better for the next time. And he did a lot of work, and it, it worked. Um, wow. And so the, it's an, the one it, I guy think in his basement got it working. That's great. <laughs> it just substantiates the fact that it's such a great tool because yep. within 48 hours of that crisis, the people running today's meet fixed it and had it up and running again. It's it's a you know what I like about it, Don. Like you were saying, is it's a it's a safe place for students to get in, make some mistakes in sharing, and yeah. then we can socialize them in with that tool. I think that's a great way before we go out into other tools. Yeah, yeah, and this, and I would I would add one other tool that we're, we've been using more. Um, well, s subtext. I don't know if anybody's going to talk about subtext, but um, this way to extend reading and subtext basically is a is a reader, a digital reader, um, and allows students to interact uh, with each other around the text, around the content. <coughs> teachers can add. I feel the same way. I'm, I'm getting that too. Um, teachers can give prompts within the, within uh, kind of in line. And students can interact with each other. So one thing um, we just tried out in fourth grade is that um, we have a group of kind of accelerated readers, and we want to differentiate um, and give them kind of kind of a, a different area to work with. And really, apparently, really quickly, they just went into it. They started interacting with each other online. Um, sorry, within the book, in line. Um, and the nice thing is, it allows it, it basically allows a parallel conversation to happen, right? So the same way today's meet can be used to you know, um, share ideas virtually, but then a teacher or students can comment on each other um, by voice. This way, I think what was happening is students were interacting with each other, making comments and annotations in line on the text, and then afterwards they kind of gathered back again and talked about that, the comments that they made on each other's uh, notes afterwards. So there's this nice, I love the idea of having kind of analog digital um, movement. Um, you know, connected virtually, but then tying it back to reality, not reality, but, you know, the analog uh, modes of communication. Yeah, we love subtext. We, uh, you know, we're one-to-one -one iPads, but we, you know, the summer was kind of our first summer of letting the kids take them home, and so one of the things we did was we had a few uh, English 3 and English 4 teachers at our high school elect to do summer reading programs using subtext, which is a great way for the teacher to see, like, wow, who's actually gone through the book? And since it gives you that real-time data as a teacher, it's great because you know, like, you know, this student has read 200 pages, but wow, he's only spending 0.1 seconds on each page, so he's just flipping through the pages really quickly to get to the end. And then, or you can embed your quizzes and discussions throughout and see who's actually participating. Um, it's great data and it's free. Now I know they got bought out by Renaissance, so that's going to be. We'll be curious to see how that kind of turns out because you always worry about a little company like that getting bought out by a bigger company. Right. Um, but they have. They have a lot of great books. Unfortunately, right now, I think just the Google Play Store is where you can get a lot of those resources. But um, we're going to use one for an admin uh, book club because we usually have a yearly book club with our you know, our administrators. We do a book study, okay. and so in the past, we've done it. Yeah, you you meet together, you get all the principals and all the you know the heads of the five families, as it were, to get together and read the book, uh, and then discuss a chapter every month in our monthly meetings face to face. But you know, we're so busy with times, like let's put it in subtext. And then we can have our discussions kind of on the side, and then we do get a face-to-face -face meeting. We'll get a little more in depth, almost like flipping admin meetings, if you will. Um, and so we're hoping to do that uh, starting in January. So I'll let you guys know how that goes. But yeah, Subtext is a great tool. 
I love that idea, and I'm sorry. I just looked down and I realized that was your, that was your, what you had mentioned. You and I, and I got, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but I I got there because I jumped. I skipped kind of my e backpack one. And e backpack is the, is we're using it in similar ways. And the whole idea is having you know rather than just having kind of chat and conversation without structure, it's chat and conversation around content. And so e backpack um, is a workflow tool that allows students to have. Um, Kind of dialogue around particular assignments, and you know, again, teaching students how do how do you um, how do you tie in kind of socialization around context or content, um, and that helps kind of contain conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big believer in blog posts, and I and, you know one of my favorite tool used to be Posterous because you could create oh, a topical yes. blog yeah. post. And it's it's one of those tools that no offense to Twitter, but Twitter bought it and then killed it, and um, oh. it it was. Posterous allowed you to create a situational, a topical blog post and have all of your students use an email address to post. And then I could look at those posts and then put them out there and then the students could just go through and read them and then comment on each other. So I started doing exit slips for class, these simple throwaway exit slips where it was just me kind of getting in tune with what was going on. And the first exit slip I ever put online on Posterous got 23,000 hits within the first three weeks. Wow. And I had no idea. Like I, I tweeted it out on Twitter, but like what what was it that drew people to that discussion on Athens versus Sparta? So um it was a lesson to me and it, it just it it grabbed my students and got their attention and made them care and that conversation went on for weeks. So that was the start of my interest in blogging. So I'm I'm doing Genius Hour this year and I'm gonna have my students create a blog post. But my purpose is actually dual. I want to I want them to have an individual blog so that I can start framing for myself future lessons. Next year, can I have individual blogs for throughout the year as a place for them to put their work out and share it? And um, so I need to construct the, the guidelines and how I'm going to help them. And I'm going to do that with a Genius Hour project that's going to be periodic this year. But um, I, part of it is I just want the students to see how good their work really is. And, and the students who sometimes quietly turn in an assignment and there's no way to share it, I, I want them to, to have an audience that's going to authenticate their work because I know that that creates energy within them to do their work and their assignments get better. Um, so that's really my goal with that. I, I have also used, like I said, I've done Skype chats. <clears throat> I start with, um, I have an LMS at school. We use Schoology. Mm -hmm. I, I love Schoology, but lately I have a criticism of Schoology in that it's a closed system. And so it's nicely contained within my room and within my school. And I think it's a great place to start. And like, I, I can't imagine doing my one-to-one -one without Schoology because some of the great things that it does to help teachers. But um, I start them in it because it's contained and they can be socialized there. But then we're going to move out of that to the blog posts that are bigger. Or ideally, I would love to get some Twitter accounts in class. Hmm. Um, I, I individually use Twitter. Um, my first experience with Twitter in the classroom was really searching the um, Arab Spring events that were happening in mm -hmm. um, in Egypt, and we found a voice in the audience, and we were listening to this person tweet about being there and why he was there, and we asked him questions, and he was responding while he was in the riots that were going on in Tahrir Square. So um, I, I, I had no idea that that was going to happen. It was just kind of suddenly something that was going on with our class and it was extremely powerful. I'm trying to find ways to replicate those events in as many units as I possibly can. I mean there's nothing more real world than that. I mean that's that's so mm -hmm. powerful and the sad thing about that the good the good part about that is that you kind of really embrace that connection and, and saw it as a moment. But I've also I hear the flip side of that is when events are happening uh, and this happened to us recently with some events where they said let's you know, I think it was the Sandy Hook, uh, you know, thing mm -hmm. that's happening here. They're like, can, let's, I had a call from a principal, our middle school principal, and basically she said, Carl, I want you to turn off the internet. And I said, well, you know, as omnipotent as, or um, <laughs> omnipresent as I may seem, I can't turn off the internet, like, yeah. in the world. You um, just call them up and ask. Come on, you know, I, can, I can turn it off for you if you need. I, I, okay. Yeah, I can it do that. I can help you out switch there. behind you, Don. Yeah, there's that little yeah. switch behind you. Just turn that off. But it was, and it brought up a good question. It was like, well... You know, and this is asked just in the chat just now about age appropriateness. So like, say, at what point do you want kids getting real time, real world 
what's happening to them. And in a one-to-one -one connected classroom, you you know, you don't really have that kind of control. You have to be comfortable with that too. So, I mean, we have filters set up obviously for some of that, but when it came to like Sandy Hook and the Boston Marathon was another one that I remember, you know, just re that, that seems fresh in my mind where middle school kids were pulling up pictures and things. And, and I was thinking in my head, I was like, middle school kids will always pull up pictures anyway um, if they can, especially if it's if it's a boy, they like the grotesque, especially here with Halloween coming up, they're going to pull up the most gory, zombie-looking thing they can. But um, when it comes to that, you know, you start thinking, what does our role as a school play? This is a bigger question than the one-to-one -one classroom, so I won't get too far into this, but, you know, when do we start saying, you know, as a teacher or as an administrator, okay, we need to shut this down because we're protecting our kids. Maybe it depends on your community. I don't know. It, uh, and that's a question that we maybe not have to answer. We don't have time to answer tonight. But I just kind of wonder what you all thought about that. Like, what role do you play? Because, Sean, you obviously embraced it. Mm -hmm. um, it took it as a teachable moment, which I love. Well, I, I like this. I, I think that what your principal did is a natural reaction. And it's what is the only thing that stops learning in a school? And it's safety. If there's a fire alarm, we stop learning fast. If there's a tornado drill, whatever, mm -hmm. as soon as safety's in question, we're done. And I think that that plays a role in internet policies because as soon as there's some sense that there's things that aren't safe out there, we want to shut things down. But I think that more important than that is what happens after school is over and those same students that we shut the internet down on go home and for the hours between, we're not all of them, but many of them are going to be at home either unsupervised or um, before their parents are there to discuss with them what's going on. And mind you, all of this is age related. Like, at what level do we expose them to the responsibility of these choices? I understand that. But how do we prepare them so that they will make good choices in the absence of adults so that they can choose what not to take in and choose what to ignore and, and, and be safe to be safer in that environment? And I think that that's an important call to action for all teachers. How are we preparing our students so that when we're not there, they can successfully navigate these traps that are in the internet? And, uh, yeah, I love that you, I mean, this is such a can of worms we're going, I mean, this is a radical, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know how, I'm just going to, I, I got a comment because um, we just had a, um, a parent meeting, what's today, two, yesterday, um, with lower school parents, grades one through four, and um, so happened that our fairly light filter was down because they're switching networks and handed out iPads and said, you know, here are some of the apps that are that uh, kids use. And then they started, of course, going and searching on the internet and saying, wait a second, my kids have access to everything of all this stuff. You know, that that's a whole other uh, question. But you know, really, our approach is how, like Sean was talking about, you know, how do we? We, we, we can't create, a, we can create a padded room in a school maybe, and maybe you can create a padded room at home, but um, that, that's, a, that's a fraction of, of the rooms that students live in and, are, and children live in. You know, there are over other kids' houses. They have access to mobile phones in the car and outside. You know, we can't, we can't create a perfectly safe world, so um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we scaffold this um, responsibility, judgment? What do you do with information? Um, how do you how do you act responsibly in a in a really massive digital world that's really unfiltered? The mo most of it is unfiltered. Um, so so I think I mean as a school you kind of have to know that, and I think it ties into if we tie it back to the connect this connected learning. Um, you know what content is okay, and you know when we were just teaching from textbooks and teaching about some of the hor horrible things that have happened in our past, like is that okay? Is the textbook safe? And you know when do you start when do you start um, you know, blocking that, blocking content. And the, I think the digital world is much less understood by parents. Yeah. Um, and so there's this gut reaction like close it down, close it down because, you know, we, we, can't, we can't control it. Well, it's Maslow's hierarchy. You know, you want to make sure, I mean, yes. if learning is going to happen, it's just like you were saying, Sean, you want to be, you know, things have to be safe. So if there's a fire alarm, you're not going to learn while there's an alarm blasting. So you want to make sure that the kids are safe before they can actually learn. But what were you going to say, Sean? Well, I was going to go towards this. Regardless of what level schools are run at, be they private schools or public schools, at some level they're a democracy or they're a product. You know, if you're if you're a school that has tuition and you pay, your your parents and their input is important because you're selling them a product and you need to to meet their needs. In public schools, the same is true. We're democracies, and so regardless of what kind of school you're in we have an obligation to have a discussion and to weigh the community values. I mean, community values and what the community thinks has legitimate weight and precedence in law. Yes. 
and no difference in education. So if you're in an area and that community talks and their value on safety says, we want to lock this down a little bit, then it's foolish for you to ignore the needs of your community and those prevailing values and to, to go fly in the face of that. So a lot of this has to do with you um, getting a sense, dipping your toe into the water with a discussion about this and either educating the community or listening to the community and, and whatever it takes to find that balance between pressing our students forward so that they can be safe in the world that they'll live in and reflecting the values that the community upholds and believes in. And I think this connectedness, what's happening with us is, I mean, people are watching these webinars and they're, they're on Twitter and they're starting to hear more about what other schools are doing. And maybe it's becoming more of a, a global thing where we're all kind of saying, well, if we can do this, maybe we can try this. And, make, you know, testing things with the community, like you said, dip your toe in the water. I mean, Texas is a perfect example. We have textbooks here that are, you know, some of them are written with evolution in them and some of them aren't. It depends on where you're living. Some classrooms, the teachers can carry guns down here. Yes, it is the Wild West here in Texas. Um, I think there's 17 school districts where teachers are allowed to carry a concealed handgun. So uh, you want to talk about safety. That, that might be another topic. Classroom yeah, that's it's easy enough. <laughs> Just pat your chest. Did I say be quiet? <laughs> yes. I think I said be quiet. That's why I have these new iPads with a Kevlar on them. That's actually pretty cool. We're, we're testing out. <laughs> no, I mean, there's no uh, single magic bullet uh, for... Oh, that was bad. <laughs> um, I, all, got it, though. But for all of this, and I think we... I mean, we could talk about the tools, and it's funny. You, you went right to today's meet, which is absolutely one of my favorite, and we talked about that. And then the flip side of that is when I presented that to teachers before, and especially, like, the middle school or early up, uh, high school, the first thing they've said is, well, wait a minute the kids don't have a login to that. Can't they just, yeah. even though it's kind of a closed loop, like you said, can't they just be anonymous and say whatever they want? And I, and I said, that's a perfect time to have that discussion about yeah. just because you're anonymous, do you have to do that? Um, so I think it's great that we're having these discussions now, and I think that parents are getting involved. I mean, as much as that may be a headache to people that have to kind of deal with, you know, we don't want to have more things for parents to kind of get upset about yeah. with education. I think it's great that we're having the conversation now before the kid gets off to college. So, yeah. um I don't know. I think I think you have to know your environment. And people in the chat that are asking questions about age restrictions and parent workshops, I think that's important to have that dialogue. If you don't have it yet in your school, you need to have that discussion. Bring parents in, have them ask the questions, or maybe present the questions to them and see if they've even thought about it. I mean, one, of the, one of the things that I think it's important to talk about, um, and something I talk to parents about, is that um, it's great to have you know this connectedness and tools in the context of education. Right, with people who care about the growth of kids. Right, it's not they're not learning about how to how to chat with strangers out in the you know out in a peer group in a in a dark alley kind of thing. They're 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 in the best possible environment to learn to make mistakes. Right, to learn how to how to act responsibly. Um, and so, like for instance, I think a couple of years ago, a parent came up to me and said, you know, why do you have to have iMessage open for students? You know, it's they're just you know they're just wasting time and they're using it badly. I said we use it because actually there's you know there's a power to that tool that can be really used well, um, but there's also bad you know ways that are not really useful and, and harmful ways they can use it. So again, just putting these tools and, and ways to connect to, to the digital world and um, resources in the context of education. I mean, what what better place? Um, what what better um, you know really ground could could you have to to try these things out? And well, kind of what you're dipping into is the idea that those those tools have power, and mm -hmm. they have power for good, and they have power to be destructive, but it's harnessing it for something that's useful. It's like fire. Fire is a very important tool. It's a great step forward in mankind, and it's also horribly destructive, and that's it for us, <laughs> to discern ways to make, to take the good from it and mitigate what could be potentially bad and teach those students to get the most out of it. it. It's no different than a car. We're going to give them all this several ton hmm. tool that they're going to have to drive, and we can <clears throat> hear that, or we can raise them and acculturate them over time. The, the better analogy is this. Every single classroom in America has scissors. Scissors <laughs> is <laughs> riveted together, we, every student, but you will ne nobody questions whether we should have scissors in a classroom because mm -hmm. those two knives that we've riveted together, every student who grabs them will hold them, point down, hold them to their chest, and they will not run when they have those scissors because we've done a really good job of socializing them to be safe. 
you, you've got a web spy cam in my office because I just had that conversation with my tech coach today. That's crazy. I said scissors. I was like, it's the same. So no one cares about scissors. They're okay with us having scissors, you know. And it's the same way. They're, it's you know, you've got experts, you've got educators who are directing the you know who are shaping tool use and you know with with intention, with 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 purpose. So um, so they're getting yeah. I was going to say, I love that, the, the, the car analogy, too. I've used that before. It's funny that Sean brought that up, because I've said that, too. He's like, you don't, you don't teach he's, he's your own kids how to drive a car. I he does. Smart. He has my camera in my office. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's so smart, man. That's why he's so smart. He's stealing their brains. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you don't, you don't take a kid to go you know, get their driver's license, and you train them. I mean, some parents may do that, but for the most part, you send them to driver school, right, and you have someone else that teaches them those things. I mean, for a couple of reasons. One, it's incredibly frustrating to try to teach your own kids things at times versus a stranger kind of doing that. But the other is you take someone who's an expert and have them kind of teach it. And I think that's, I, I don't know, I guess maybe because the scissor point has been driven into us since 1900, we're now all aware of it and it just becomes kind of secondhand knowledge. And all this stuff that we're talking about today is so new. I mean, it's a challenging thing. And as parents, I mean, I have a four-year-old daughter at home, and what she does is, you know, I, she has a little – electric car that goes about four miles an hour and she loves that thing and she'll want to go all the way off the driveway down the road and my job is to make sure that she goes to a certain point you know the end of the driveway and then turns around now being a four-year-old what's she gonna do she's gonna test the limit and that's the same thing kids are gonna do with the internet they're gonna try to push the boundary a little bit and it's your job to kind of stand there and say okay here's a little bit more you can go a little bit further you're a little bit older now you can go out into the street a little bit and I'm gonna be kind of over here on the side versus just blocking you and I think that's kind of the same thing we're doing as educators, but also with our parents. And, and I think it all comes back to, again, that community value. What, are you, what is your community value? We turned on YouTube for all of our students last year, and it was kind of a shock to the system, but we waited until the community was ready. We talked to them about it. We talked to teachers about it and made sure they were all on board with it um, before we did it. So it's always having that constant dialogue. It comes down to simple, I mean, connection, if you will. And you know what? And when, when you do open those things up, our school district three or four years ago had uh, YouTube shut off for teachers. And then they turned it on and teachers started using it effectively. And two years after the teachers used it, it was open for the students. And now students are using it effectively. Um, and it, I think a lot of it is what you're saying. Like you can't just turn it on and open it up and not have a dialogue and expect it to work. There's going to be problems. But if you wade into it and you construct towards the eventual time when that happens, you'll make progress. That's what we do. We set goals and we reach out to achieve them. Um, anyway, we're advocates for technology, obviously, and you know I, I've always said there's nothing more dangerous than a table full of Kool-Aid drinkers trying to make decisions hmm. about something that's <laughs> important. But um, the fact of the matter is that you know things can go wrong, and you get to a point where you start to look ahead and see what can go wrong, and try to address that in a way that's going to support students. So when things go wrong, it's not that things won't go wrong; it's that we know what we're going to do when they do. Hmm. And the one thing we've seen in our one-to-ones is that there's a balance of uh, that distraction, kind of you know troublesome things that could happen with it versus the instructional side. And when there's actually more instructional engagement and more in-depth learning happening with the tool, we see it's almost like anti-correlation, I think that's the term, where the distraction level goes down when there's actually a lot more kind of engaging content or engaging dialogue for the kids to have. They see it as more of a learning tool and less of a distraction gaming tool. Right. Um, but I think the kind of the first you know, with all these tools, the first thing they see, they see an iPad, the first thing parents think about is, you know, what app? They think about Angry Birds. Well, now it's probably not that. It's yeah. uh, Candy Crush, I guess. That's the one that everyone mm -hmm. loves. My wife loves that app. Um, but, and so that's the first thing that comes to their mind. The difference between that and tools of the past, like Atari and Pong and even the Commodore 64, I used to still, I almost still owned up until about a year ago. Um, those are all kind of gaming devices, but this has so many, these devices have so many, uh, educational purposes. It's just a matter of us getting that message out there, but also seeing that increase in our classrooms. I think that helps a lot with the challenges that we run into. And Don, you mentioned uh, kind of in your notes, we we're talking about some of the challenges now, but um, you know, connectivity could be a challenge. It's something as simple as that if you really want to keep a connected classroom. How do you do that if you don't have wireless? And maybe that's good in some ways. Um, yeah, I think. Well, go ahead, Don. No, go ahead, Sean. That's okay. You know, I think maybe this is a good place to talk about like. We talked about the community, and we talked about the values, and we talked about what's important. And I think one really way, good way to demonstrate the importance of connectivity is to use the connectivity to first bring your community and your teachers into, or your parents into the classroom and into the school. And yeah. by doing that, 
using that social media, they develop an understanding of how it is important to be connected. And if anything happens to that, to, to disrupt their connectivity, they're going to see how difficult it is to be kept out. And, and I think that that is conversely something that we can demonstrate for our classrooms. As much as it's powerful to you to be brought in, it's very important, powerful for us to be able to reach out. And the same feeling that you have being connected to us inside and knowing, think about what it means as a parent. I, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm busy, we, we travel, and uh, I love being able to check with my students through Edmodo or the daily emails or the school's webpage to find out what they're doing in class so that when I come home I can talk to my, my kids and I can validate the teacher's work and say, you know, what they said in class today is important and I want to reiterate that it's important to me too, not just your teacher. And when we can start working in harmony like that, both from parent into the classroom and teachers out to the community, um, I think that's a good way to win over an understanding of what this is all about. Go ahead, Don. No, I was, as you know, he, Sean, you mentioned this last time too, and I keep, you know, it's just it keep, it always strikes me, you know, um, connecting parents into the classroom. I think that I we we haven't really done that. We've done it with you know uh, parent visitors, but I love that idea to kind of because they want to know what's going on, and you yep. can do it in a you can do it in a way that doesn't feel intrusive because you know you you want to create a healthy balance. You don't want parents you know walking in and sitting into the back of the classroom every day, but kind of to give them a taste of. This is these are the kind of this is the value you know it's adding value to you you can see what's going on you can be right. part of some of the conversations I mean that you just couldn't do that before mm -hmm. you know you can't have 20 parents in a room with with students learning without it being immensely distracting so in, 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 in yeah. a way this is happening just with grade books I, I don't know about you yeah yeah. Uh, yeah we do online grade books yeah we, yep. we use Infinite Campus and I have learned the speed at which information travels is amazing I can post <laughs> the grades in my classroom watch every student in my class pick up their phone because it vibrates once they get a message saying that the grades have been posted. <laughs> and then there's like a five minute delay and then parents will start texting them to say good job on your test or wow. what happened on that test or make sure you go look at you know and I in my classroom by hitting a button within 10 minutes set off this chain of events that leads to parents to engage and, and there's a, a level at which maybe that's not like there's a, an intensity that we imagine in our head as a stereotype, but inherently that's good. I have yeah. parents within the hour supporting my values and goals in class, and I can harness that power to make my classroom a really strong and powerful place. I think that bringing some level of transparency to what I'm doing in my class um, on a day-to-day -day basis answers that. Yes. I guess it goes along with the grade book, and it's just a continuation. Now they're not seeing like us when we teach. The parents are now seeing the process by which the grades are arrived at for their students, not just the product that their students are creating in terms of a number in the gradebook. That's a that's amazing connector. So if you think about the difference between that and when I was you know teaching fifth grade ten years ago, and the only time the parents would see that grade was nine weeks. You know, every nine weeks they would see, okay, this is how you did, and this is why you did that. We if I didn't get the mailbox before you, because if I got to the mailbox before you, they didn't even see that. <laughs> And then you're hiding it because you didn't want to get, in, yeah, you didn't want to get in trouble for it. That's, I mean, of course, I think that's great to have that connection. You're right, you know, Sean. It could be kind of overdone too, where you have the opposite of that, where someone's, you know, the helicopter parent that's always kind of way too involved. Um, but I think for the most part, that's a good problem to have. You want parents to be that involved with it. I think, and what Don was saying is having that kind of distraction of like, you know, having teachers walk in the, or parents walk into the room. I think we're asking them to think so differently. But when they walk into our buildings, at least in my building still, they see the old classroom. So they still see that memory in their head. They still see the desks and rows because we still have those old desks. So I almost think, and this kind of leads to the next kind of big topic here, here at the end, which I think Don will really enjoy, which is how do we change the layout of the classroom in a one-to-one -one connected classroom? How do we change physically? I mean, this has nothing to do with technology, but what do we do differently to kind of really maximize our learning space? Because at this point, it's all been single point of delivery down lots of rows. Um, but now we have technology everywhere and it's all mobile, so what do we need to do to ship that? Don, do you have thoughts? Because I know you, you've done some amazing things with the Hillbrook School there. Yeah, I mean, we've been thinking about this a lot, and I think um, one, of the, one of the things I always ask, and, and we talk, uh, you know, I talk to teachers about, is what do, you want your, what do you want learning to look like? You know, do you want it to be kind of a single point of kind of uh, thought generation? You know, do you want the teacher in the front and kind of folks listening? Do you want a lot of things um, happening at the same time? And I think... 
you know, you have, there's, all of those are possible. And so if you want, if you want to switch or have those options, either a teacher-led classroom or students working in groups or student, students working individually, if, if that at all is possible, right, because of devices, because of uh, individualized kind of work going on, um, how, do you, how do you create a physical environment that allows that to happen? And I think it's, it's not what we're really discovering is, is you can't have a single environment to do, that does all those things. You need an agile space. You need a space that, can, that you oh, can transform. Can. Yeah, and, and you, want, you want to be able to transform it according to what you're trying to do, right? One of the, one of the teachers um, a couple years ago I was talking to her when we were you know, playing with this iLab um, said, you know, what if um, there were different places in the classroom where you could do different things? You know, maybe in one corner you could go to get, you know, help from the teacher or guidance. Another corner, you could work with peers and kind of collaborate with peers. Another space is where I could work individually. And I think that was the beginning of a conversation around what if there was a space in the classroom for all of these kinds of work to happen simultaneously. Um, but you need, you need a place that you can flex um, pretty quickly because it's also, you know, it's also an obstacle. If you have big old desks that you know make tons of squealy noises when you're trying to move things around, <laughs> or chairs that you're dragging across the floor. Um, that that gets in the way of, of learning, and it becomes really inconvenient. And then you then you kind of forget that that's an option. I I just can't do that. We're just gonna stick in our spots and do the work here, and and that impacts what you can do. And and so I, and I just make one note just on that same kind of topic is we're working with school in Chicago, you know, National Teachers Academy with um with Autumn and and. Uh, Jenny and Anita, and um, they've just introduced some kind of uh, furniture wheels, you know, some of the Bradford stuff. It's, they've got chairs on wheels, they've got tables on wheels. And the students, one of the students commented, like, you know, I can move my chair without making this awful squealy noise anymore. And I can move, you know, I can move around um, the space and move to where I need to go to do my work. And I think, nice. Um, so, and, and this, this goes to students being thoughtful about what they need to do a particular kind of work and the kind of spaces they need to do a particular kind of work with on their, on their own or with other people. This I'm yeah. sharing right now real quick, Sean, and then I'll let yeah. you kind of, kind of say two cents. This is actually from a, uh, this is a third grade classroom that we just now got um, kind of a model classroom that we're trying to set up. <laughs> this is the futuristic classroom. We have the little bar stools there. You can kind of stay yeah, in the chat. Yeah, it's beautiful. Nice. And those are the steel case notes. Yep, steel case, no chairs, um, which, you know, I want to say are about $600, <laughs> but uh, the one thing about this classroom, if you look at it closely, there's only, um, there's 22 kids in this room, but there's only 12 desks there. When I walked in, I asked the lady, I said, you know, I asked the teacher, I said, you know, you don't have enough desks for all your kids, and she said, we're not going to do assigned seats. The kids are going to sit where they're comfortable learning when they need to do a certain task. Yeah. And so she set up this idea paint on the walls where kids can do whiteboard space. Some kids like to be near the windows. They learn better. Um, so they'll sit in these kind of higher chairs or they want to have the comfortable seating. And she loved it. Uh, I came in after the school started and I said, I want to see what this is like. And she goes, it's absolutely amazing. I'll never go back to the old way again. And when, when parents walked in, the, just the color on the walls, just something as simple as that, they actually said, this is not, I mean, they're like, I want to come back to school if this is what yeah. school is like. Which was great because she was really worried that they, maybe they'd be a little scared yeah. about it. But because it's not, it's that. not anything. It's not anything what they think learning looks like or what a classroom should look like. And so yeah, you can get mixed reactions from parents. Is this academic enough? Is this going to enforce the, you know, real learning? Where is the structure? Where yeah, where's the structure? structure? Well, yeah. I I think I can provide a nice interim step here because when you think of the traditional classroom, which is very much in rows, or which beyond being in rows is in like the U shape, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, my school is in the second year of its pilot. We suspect that next year we'll be approved to go one-to-one uh, -one for everybody. But that transition is, is not easy. And it, it's hard to put aside long-held ideas about the way things should be and what normal is. I was sharing with a, a coworker who is very open-minded that I don't assign seats this year because last year I realized nobody ever asked me to change their seats because we move around the classroom so much. You're never in your assigned seat. It's like the students like the assigned seat because it was comfortable, um, but that was like their home base where they kind of like went back after our group work was done. So I didn't assign seats this year. My students picked where they are. They never stay there, um, but I, I'm restricted in doing something innovative because I only have that classroom for three periods a day. 
So in order to move towards these spaces, it's going to take more than innovative teachers willing to connect and change the format of their lessons. It's going to take the support of institutions who are going to say that we're going to act on these values at a bigger level. Because there's going to be teachers who are going to want to hold tightly. We had a teacher who retired last year, an excellent teacher, very traditional, and he wanted his chalkboard, and he refused to let them put a whiteboard in. And um, didn't want it, you know, there was a teacher who held on to their overhead projector until the day that they <laughs> retired because it's a comfort level and there's some, com I mean, I, there's just a piece in having what we're comfortable with. But, so it's very hard for me, uh, you, you said something that really connected with me, Don, those desks are in the way. And I can't tell you how often I feel like those desks are in the way. I have to go to my students into feeling comfortable twisting them around to face each other. I say groups, if you can't see the eyes of everyone in your group, you're not in a group, you're just individuals working next to each other. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, so I have to have a series of values for what group work looks like, and I'm fighting the furniture all the time. And I'm not going to complain about my district because my district's been really supportive of one-to-one, -one, and we're in a process of transforming it. Um, but I aspire to one day be able to kind of tear down some of the patterns in the classroom that were geared towards teacher lecture. It doesn't make sense to have tools for individual expression and learning and creativity and then put them into rows where they all stare at the teacher as if the teacher is the font of all knowledge. That's yeah, and, and I, I mean, one of the things, you know, and I just was going to share a few of these while, while, I, while I talk. Um, that we've noticed is that this the whole idea of a room reset is really interesting. Um, can can you are these coming up? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Great. So this is this is just the iLab and the whole idea that the room is reset at the beginning of a, at the end of a classroom and so there's no configuration at all. So at the end of the class, kind of students push everything and fold everything up to the sides, and at the beginning of the class, students have to they kind of have to know what they're doing, right? The teacher says this is the kind of work we're doing, um, and and set up the room according to what you think you need. Um, it's super powerful. And, and one, yeah, it takes a little more time, but two, you have students who, who kind of have an idea of what, the, what kind of work they're doing um, before, before they even get started, because they're thinking about what kind of environment do I need um, to do this. And that, that's a connectivity issue that's beyond just having a flexible space. You're asking students to build an environment conducive to the, the issue and topic at hand. I mean, yeah. This is what businesses do. This is what I mean. This is a real life skill. It's the same thing for your home. You build a home that represents a feeling, an emotion, a need, or or something, an idea. And I think that it's a, an excellent next level connectivity with the work that I do and the place that I am. And as I was watching those photos, Don, it slapped me like right across the face where I've seen that. I was like, I've seen that room somewhere before, and it, and it wasn't at a school. It was at this place called um, Google. <laughs> and and, and yeah. it's amazing to me that you know these are the modern companies and these startup companies that are doing this where they have these flexible spaces, and you can do small group work over here and collaborate over there. Um, and and th that's the business that our kids are kind of going into. A lot of our kids are, at least, and yet we're still kind of forcing them back to that structure. So seeing that at your school, I was like, I've seen that somewhere before, only that people were a little bit taller. Uh, okay. So that's, well, good. that's that kind of next step. It's, it's neat because it's not just about the space, it's about choice. And that's what I've been, I've been thinking a lot about, the choices we give our students. So mm -hmm. in the same way, you know, they, they're gonna, they have choices in, in the, outside the classroom, and they choose, you know, who to connect with and who to, um, and how to communicate and what to look at. In the same way, can they choose, and I know I see we have a couple minutes left, um, they choose the way they learn. If they know how they learn best, you know, why not? That's a really powerful thing. If I know how I learn best and I'm going to set myself up to do that kind of work, um, I know that, and if I know what kind of environment I really um, excel in, I will, I'll replicate that environment to do well. So why not? The more choices that we give our students, the more they understand um, how they operate well in the world. I think we have to get to, and we're getting to that point where we also think, you know, in, in our, and it seems like you're doing it different than I am, and Sean's doing it different, and that's okay. We're all kind of getting there at the same time, but ours was, you know, we pushed the devices out, and now the room is changing, and now the pedagogy is changing based yeah. on the device. So it was a little bit of a ready, fire, aim approach. But uh, I, I think you got to have that openness in your district, and I think from what it sounds like, you guys have a very supportive district. So what I'm going to ask you to do, because we have about one minute left, so uh, kind of a parting comment about the one-to-one -one connected classroom, just kind of parting thoughts. Try to do it in two sentences or less. Go, Sean. Um, you got to take the risk to make the connections. 
and it's going to be hard because it's hard to take that risk until you feel the power of an effective connection. Find an effective connection, and the rest of it will all make sense. Very good. That was a, like more than two sentences and like a lot of That's so lame, man. Here we go. My haiku. Um, I think education has to be relevant to students' lives and has to feel important um, in order to um, to stick. That's like one long sentence. I would say that was more than a five, seven, five. I to run on. It should be two or three. <laughs> and here's mine. Ready? Um, just do it. Okay, Ooh, that was a very nice quote. <laughs> All it. That's like three syllables, three words. That's good stuff. You got it. You got it. So uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank Sean and I want to thank Don for joining us tonight. Um, I do want to invite you guys to come to our next webinar, which will be actually next Tuesday, October 29th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where Tom DeCord will lead a webinar on connected administrators. And you may see someone very familiar in that uh, chat. I think Patrick Larkin as well is joining us and Eric Schnedeger from, uh, so we have some East Coast folks in the room. Uh, and you can find all of these webinars on the edtechteacher.org website. So thank you guys so much for joining us. And an archive of this will be on the website very soon, as well as everything that happened in the chat. We'll have links in there for you. So I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Don. Everyone have a great night. Thanks, Carl. Right. Thanks, Carl.